As noted in your chapter reading, a new oil boom is underway in North Dakota. The Bakken Formation is the largest oil accumulation the United States Geological Survey has ever assessed, containing as much as 400 billion barrels of crude oil. While the economic gains of this boom have been enormous, they have come with costs. Housing shortages, crime, air pollution issues, and concerns over drinking water safety, to name a few. Notably, the boom has also affected world national ga natural gas markets and made natural gas cheap enough to displace coal here in the United States as our primary fuel for generation of electricity. That's a good thing. The use of hydraulic fracturing, also known as fracking, has made the boom possible, but many people worry about the safety of the process and the future of their communities. As review, remember that oil and natural gas are fossil fuels, created over millions of years from the carbon-rich remains of dead organisms. We remember that coal formed from plant remains buried in beneath tropical swamps, in the muck, in low oxygen environments. Oil and natural gas form in marine environments, where tiny microscopic marine organisms, phytoplankton and zooplankton, die and fall to the ocean floor, where they are buried in a low oxygen environment. With little to no oxygen present in the sediments on the seafloor, decomposition is low or absent, and the remains are chemically transformed into oil and natural gas. The second diagram is similar to the one above, but it even more clearly shows the type of deposit that geologists look for when they're seeking out oil. They are looking for ancient marine sedimentary rocks, like limestone and sandstone, where the oil and natural gas are formed. Further, though, they are looking for regions that have shale on top of that source rock. Shale is another marine sedimentary rock, but it is made out of compacted mud, and it is not very permeable. Thus, especially when sedimentary rock layers get folded, it creates a nice cap to contain the oil and the natural gas. Geologists look for these upturned folds that are capped by shale, and then they drill into the permeable sandstone or limestone beneath it to extract the oil. Notably, the shale contains oil too, but until recent technological advancements, like fracking, it has not been accessible because it is too impermeable to release the oil. So where do we find oil and natural gas? Check out infographic 19.2. Notably, this map is done by continent, not country, so the bars are not located over their precise deposits, but it's still informative. First, interestingly, in general, anywhere we find oil used to be a marine environment. In the United States, much of our oil drilling is in the Gulf or off the coast. However, you might say, what about Texas and Oklahoma and North Dakota? These are not oceans. Well, actually, there used to be a huge inland sea in what is now the middle of our country. That's why there's oil there. Next, let's look in more detail. What countries have the most proven oil reserves? Here's a map from the Energy Information Administration. The top five countries in terms of proven or proved oil reserves are, in order, Venezuela, Saudi Arabia, Canada, Iran, and Iraq. Four of these five countries are countries that we have political issues with. Would we be involved with Iran, Iraq, or Saudi Arabia if their chief export were carrots? Interestingly, number six and seven in the world are Kuwait and Libya, two other conflict zones for us. We are in the top ten in proven reserves, but where we really excel is production. We're number one in production. Drill, baby, drill. Let's see how fast we can use it up. I can't help but think it would be, make more sense to make fewer cheap plastic shoes and keychains and save that oil for things that really matter. But that's just my two cents. Well, we need all that oil we drill, right? No. As noted previously, there are a whole lot of senseless 
plastic products created, but also we export oil. We are in the top 20 of oil exporting countries by volume. And looking at the graph, we are steadily increasing our oil exports. Notably, we are still a net importer. We import more than we export. But technically, we could cut our imports in half if we used all of our domestic production. Okay, let's backtrack a bit. We need to define what is meant by a proven reserve. Proven or proved reserves are the amount of fuel that is economically extractable using current technology. It's important to note that the proven reserve number can go up or down. It goes up when we find more oil, not super likely at this point, and it goes down as we use oil. And it also goes up as new technologies are developed, which make oil extraction cheaper, like fracking. Additionally, price of oil affects reserves. For example, from 2014 to 2015, the price of oil dropped 47%, and the price of natural gas dropped 42%, mainly due to massive production in the United States and elsewhere. Because oil and natural gas were so cheap, some of the oil we know about is no longer economically extractable. So, according to EIA data, our oil reserves went down 11.8% in that time period, and our national gas reserves went down by 16.6%. So proven reserve numbers can change as markets change. Regardless of the fluctuations, at current extraction rates, oil will last probably another 40 to 50 years, and natural gas reserves may last maybe 60 to 100 years unless, of course, we start pumping even faster. In the United States, we're pumping like crazy, but we're actually past our peak oil, likely. And it's unclear exactly when the world will hit peak oil or if we've already hit it. We're probably pretty close if we haven't hit it already. So even if we consider unconventional oil and natural gas reserves, it's pretty clear that oil and natural gas are not the energy sources for the future. As your book points out, all this oil extraction, and then the refining, and then the combustion, lead to many environmental costs, which are generally external costs that we all pay, regardless of whether we use the fuel, as they're not included in the purchase price. Maybe if they were internalized, we'd make more sensible decisions regarding fossil fuels. Be sure you can list and briefly describe several environmental costs of oil and natural gas extraction, and of fracking in particular. So next, next let's talk about fracking. As we start to turn towards more unconventional oil and gas sources, the environmental costs are generally going to be higher, and the energy return on energy invested is generally lower. Infographic 19.8 shows North American unconventional oil and natural gas reserves. We remember that conventional oil reserves contain oil that can be extracted by traditional pumping wells using primary, secondary, and tertiary production methods. For more review on the conventional oil extraction, see Infographic 19.4 in your textbook. Unconventional reserves are oil or natural gas that cannot be recovered by traditional wells, but may be recovered using alternative techniques. Unconventional deposits include tight oil, also called shale oil, like in the Bakken Formation in North Dakota, and also similarly shale gas, which is natural gas that exists in impermeable shale. Fracking of shale gas has made the U.S. the number one exporter of natural gas in the world and 40% of our production is from fracking. Another unconventional source in the news lately is the Alberta tar sands, for which the Keystone oil pipeline to Texas is planned, so that the oil can be exported. It's not for our use. Tar sands are likely the most dis environmentally destructive and energy-intensive way to extract oil. It produces four times as much greenhouse gases as conventional extraction, Basically, the area is clear-cut, 
then overburden is removed, and then the oil actually has to be heated up to make it come out of the ground. All right, so how does all this petroleum get processed? It's not used straight out of the ground like coal. Let's quickly look at how petroleum is refined to make many different petroleum-based fuels and products. At a refinery, the crude oil is heated in a fractionation tower. Compounds with a low boiling point, like jet fuel, turn to gas immediately and float up to the tower and are collected as they cool and reliquify. Compounds with higher boiling temperatures, like asphalt, are collected lower down the tower at higher temperatures. Lastly, what can we do? We're running out of oil and natural gas, and the environmental impacts of the mining and use of oil and natural gas are disastrous. Well, for oil, most of our oil goes to transportation and industry. So, drive less, use a more energy efficient car, buy less stuff, buy local, etc. For natural gas, it's used for industry, residential and commercial heating of air and water, and electricity generation. So, insulate your home, weather strip your doors, use energy efficient appliances, turn off your lights, install solar, buy less stuff, etc. There are so many things we can all do to be part of the solution.